I have a very ambitious party, so the quicker the better. Uh, you have two days. You have two. Uh, oh, okay. Two. One, to two. one to two. Yeah. Okay, one to two. Okay, this is. I have fourteen pages, so. Yeah, yeah that's probably the one side of the piece. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, this so semester. Today, the, tomorrow. You mean? Uh, well, I'm Ben McAdam, <laughs> and uh, this semester the Peripatetic Seminar at the University of Calgary is doing a series on uh, stacks. Uh, so, I'm just very happy to have Jet Toys kick this off. So, uh, we'll begin with an introduction, uh, introduction to sheet theory. So, hmm? oh right, so we should do an outline. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So we're going to start off with an introduction to sheet theory. And when we say sheet theory, growth and deep topos is really so not, not taught. So one, we're going to be doing an introduction. Uh, and this is the first talk or two here with Jeff Boys. Um, and then next, uh, we'll be going over some well-adapted models of synthetic differential geometry. Uh, we might just do one. Depends on how long it takes. Uh, SDG. And then uh, we will do a presentation on sheets as uh, localizations. just to introduce uh, weighted co-limits and weighted limits. <coughs> uh, and then finally, we'll get into stacks. Uh, oh, there's also descent theory right oh, after. Oh, right, yes. Right after the enriched category. This is what happened. Oh, yes. Enriched? Right? Oh, I thought that was enriched. <laughs> <laughs> This is all. Uh, so descent happened, uh, and then stacks. Uh, we will do uh, stacks as two one sheets, two one sheets, and uh, as vibration satisfying sheets and vibration satisfying descent. Next will be stack cohomology. So, uh, when we begin with describing sheaves as sheaves on a category, uh, we're going to use the idea of sheaves on a scheme or sheaves, sheaves on a topological space to see what our theory should have as its kind of core impetus and generalize that so we can get geometry running in a very general framework. Uh, my perspective on sheaves will be admittedly geometric in nature as opposed to the more categorical or logical side of sheaves that you might see 
from uh, topospheres or toposophers, if you really want. But uh, so the basic idea of sheaves is you have an object, say x, as a topological space, and you want to know everything you can about x. So say x is the projective, re the projective complex line, or the Riemann sphere. One natural thing that you would want to study is the ring of holomorphic functions on x. But a classical result of complex analysis shows that the ring of entire functions on the Riemann sphere is just the complex numbers. So in this way, if we're trying to understand, say, the analytical structure of analytical complex manifolds, our theory is going to be, well, just straight single variable complex analysis because sometimes there just isn't enough going on there. However, this is where we get into the notion of gluings and restrictions, because if we take a gluing of x, so if we have a collection of open subspaces, ui into x, such that uh, the union of the uis happens to be uh, x, then what we can actually do is understand, say, the structure of holomorphic functions on ui and get something that uh, generically properly contains the complex numbers. So sheaves are going to respect this and record this data. One thing that sheaves do that is very important for your intuition of sheaves is they give local information about global structure. So in this case, our global structure is P1C, or, and we can understand the analytical functions that are defined on this uh, variety, scheme, manifold, whatever word you want to say that's geometric. And in order to study that, study that analytical nature, what we want to do is instead see all these functions here, all these rings of analytic functions. However, one other thing that's really important about sheaves is that they respect these gluings. So if we have such a gluing, it would be nice to know that as we restrict to open subspaces or open intersections of the UI, that we don't get somewhere different depending on paths. So if we start with, say, two open spaces, UI and UJ, and I'll have a nice little picture over here so that we can see what's going on. So we have a UI and we have a UJ. It would be nice if the case that if we restrict down to the intersection of the UI and the UJ, in either way, that we get the same object. Because we know that this happens for gluings. So any sheaf or anything we want to study in should respect these gluings. So just like how understanding the global structure might be hard or difficult or awkward, any functor we define on these or any function we define on these should respect the fact that this is the same object and it doesn't matter if I plunk it in here or plunk it in here, I still have the same subspace. So another way to say that is uh, going through, we're going to go through the categorical language now just so contravariant, you mean, or anything like that? I was pointing out. Uh, restriction. So the point is that this is a restriction, row for row restriction, of UI. This is an O of UI. Yeah. So the point is we're restricting from the space UI down to this intersection here. So, or in other words, if there's a. Well, yeah, we're going to be looking at restrictions because the gluings are really determined by what they're doing here and how we patch them all together. So anything that we're going to study these to give the local information about this structure, if it's going to preserve that object, it had better preserve the patches where we've glued. I don't mean to throw you off your cadence. I just mean that row is going from O of UI down to O of the intersection, not from the space. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. That? Yes. So here you can think of this as restricting analytical functions 
on UI to analytical functions on that subspace of UI. So uh, one thing we're going to need in order to generalize this further and get some intuition of how we're going to be do doing category theory or geometry in a category is what it means to glue. Because this is really nice for intuition. We have a geometrical patch here and we're just gluing, but what if our objects in a category have nothing to do with spaces? Like what if they're, say, sheaves and we're trying to find topologies on a sheaf category or stuff like that? Well, uh, consider the, the uh, following. In topological spaces, if U and V are open uh, subsets, then the intersection of U and V is a pullback diagram, where the arrows here are the injections of subspaces. So one uh, in the category of open subspace uh, subsets of the topological spa space X. Yes. Sorry. Throughout my notes, I was using you as the global object, so that will happen a lot. I'm going to apologize now, but keep me honest. So the point is, when we're going to be doing geometry in a category in general, we should be thinking of pullbacks or fiber products as generalized intersections. So that's going to motivate, actually, a lot of what we do. So uh, let's jump right, jump right into things. Uh, uh, so if you're going to have something that respects these gluings, we could say we have a functor f from open sets of x into, say, set. And studying these functors will give us ways of Determining basic properties of X, say if X is a sober space, which doing topology with non-sober spaces is just silly, right? So we're going to start by considering functors here. Now, the statement that says that this respects gluings is the statement that for any open set, uh, for any U that's open in X, If we have a gluing or a covering, covers U, then we would want basically, we want there to be two. We want F to agree on these intersections. So we would want the maps F from U, uh, this contravariant, uh, down to, from any element of the gluing down to its intersections, to be the same thing as uh, what it's doing on the other side. So this is saying that as we restrict down from ui to the intersection of ui and uj, that's the same as starting in uj and restricting down to here. But this only tells us how this is behaving on these two objects. So the way of recording that this happens for the whole object that the ui is covering is saying that the diagram where we start with an object, fu, we move down into the product over all i and i of the fui's, and then we consider all the different pairs of intersections and move into the doubly indexed product of ij and i, and we consider f of the intersections. So, this map here 
is just the pairing map of all restrictions. So there's a restriction from, U I, from f of u down to f of ui for every i and i, and you just consider all of them simultaneously. And here, we have two maps, p and q, where p is induced by, if we take the first, the ith projection down to uh, f of ui, we can then restrict from ui to the subset ui including uj and take f of that restriction to get into f of ui intersect uj, which has to commute with the ij projection. And here we have, say, a jth projection down onto f uj into, and here we have, once again, f of rho from uj onto the intersection ui with uj into the product, or into f uj, which has to commute with the, or ui intersect uj, where this is the ij projection again. So, in other words, q is induced by projecting onto uj and then looking at the restrictions here, and P is induced by projecting onto UI and looking at the left-handed projections. Or if you want to think of this in terms of the pullback, this is the first projection and that's the second projection. So uh, what we want to do in order to say these are respect gluings is that we want this to be an equalizer diagram. Because this is saying whatever restrictions we consider, if we're over here, there's a lift into either side, and it's unique. It's uniquely determined by what F is doing. So this is going to be how we get our sheet theory running in categories generally, and that'll determine what we call a pre-topology. So, uh, the basic idea here is when we're working with categories in general, we want to know what it means to cover and then to determine sheaves, we want to have contravariant functors in the set which respect these covers and respect these gluings. So to get that theory running, we should probably know what it means to be a cover in a topological space generally. Uh, before that, I'm going to just make a definition that I'm going to use throughout of a pre-sheaf, and then we're going to move back in. So, A pre-sheaf on a category C is a functor of P from C off into set. So Another way that I'm going to write this, just as notation, so uh, the functor category from uh, from C off into set is going to be denoted as the internal categorical hom from C off to set. Just in case you haven't seen that notation before, I want to clarify it now because a lot of the statements go faster if I can just say P is in this category here. So anyway, we're now going to focus on how we get these ideas of coverages and coverings working in general categories with fiber products. You're going to set as a convenience. Yes, you can get this theory running in any topos, but it's significantly more difficult. Uh, 
And the reason why it works is if I replace set with an elementary topos, I get a topos back, and a lot of this theory ends up working internally the same way, but it's with an E-enriched theory, and it's more difficult. When we're, but as far as the growth and deep topos theory and classical sheaf theory is concerned, it's all defined by sheaves into set, which is nice in some way also because set is the terminal topos. So I think this seminar will be interested in in cues and other things. Yeah. Well, and uh, at times. Yes, like group schemes or sure. stuff like that. So those often come down from a factorization of, say, factorizing from C off into group and then the composing with the forgetful functor, the or the Hahn version of that. So or doing other such stuff internally. But that's a little beyond what we're going to focus on for this talk anyway. Anyway, uh, now, in order, the object or gadget which records what it means to be a cover in a category is a growth and deep pre-topology or a basis. I'm going to use pre-topology as my definition of choice, but if you're feeling particularly lazy, uh, basis works just as well. So a growth and deep pre-topology tau on a category C with fiber products is a collection of covers uh, of every of each object will denote the collection of covers, tau of u, for each uh, u in c. I'm going to perversely drop the object of c there. Uh, it's just quicker. For each object u of c, such that, well, here we have ideas of how covers should play. So one, the first thing we're going to say is, well, if I have an isomorphism between an object, that had better be a cover. An isomorphism had better cover an object because otherwise what we're doing doesn't really capture a coverage. So the first axiom says if uh, phi from v to u is an isomorphism in C, then uh, the set containing phi from v to u is a cover in C, or in tau. So uh, intu your intuition is isos are covers. Now, another piece of intuition we should have is that, well, if I have a coverage, so if I have a cover uh, phi from ui to u, such that i is an i, is a covering of u, and if for each i, uh, we have that there's a further coverage, psi ij, from say u ij into ui, such that j's are just indexed by some set ji, is in tau of ui, 
Well, if each of these guys covers UI, and if all the UIs cover U, then all of the Psi-IJs for all of the I's had better cover U as well. So the axiom says that uh, the cover composed of composites, Bi, pre-composed with Psi ij from uij into u for i and i and j and ij, or ji, sorry, is a cover of u. So the intuition here is covers are transitive. And finally, covers play well with intersection. Because if I have, a, say, a subspace of an object U, and I have a cover of U, then the intersection of that subspace B with all the covers itself covers B. So uh, if rho is just any morphism, from V to U, and if, uh, say we have a cover phi I from UI to U of U, and that's a tau coverage of U, then uh, the set of projections from, say, first projections, it doesn't matter, of V fibered over U with the UI into V, such that I is an I, covers V. Uh, the set uh, where pi 1I is the map uh, the first projection appearing in the diagram, well, V fibered over U with UI, second projection with the ith index. Uh, here we have the first projection down onto V. Here we have rho down onto U, and here we have phi I. So what this tells us is that covers play well with pullback, or the pullback of a cover is a cover. Which, uh, yes? Another way to say this is that your covers form a displacement. Yes. I would not have known that, but because I don't know anything about those, but thank you. So uh, these axioms are straightforward, so I should give you some examples of just the sort of different things that these let us describe and do geometry with in a more general way. So uh, the first example is uh, if C is the set of the category of open sets on a topological space X, Define tau by saying that a cover that you the UIs, a set of UIs cover U for I and I is in is a cover if and only if uh, the union of the UIs is U. And it's reasonably straightforward to see that all these axioms are preserved. So for instance, since the category of open sets on a topological space is a poset, the only isomorphisms are identities, and well, the union of a singleton index set of U is just U, so it covers itself for stupid reasons. Uh, pullback or covers 
are transitive because you can, if you have any cover of one of these guys, you just double index the union and do some index ninjutsu to show that it also covers you. Uh, and pullbacks uh, covers are preserved by pullback because anytime you have this intersection, V is a subset of U, and this union captures U inter V intersect U, which is exactly U. So this forms a pre-topology on the category of open sets. And in this way, we get all of topological sheaf theory as an example, which is the best way to annoy topologists. But another example, uh, take C as the category of affine schemes. Now, say that uh, a, cup, a set of morphisms, phi i, from u i to u, is a tau cover of u, uh, if and only if the phi i are jointly surjective, are jointly surjective, uh, flat, and finitely presented. This determines a pre-topology on the category of affine schemes, which is uh, the FPPF pre-topology which I can never remember the French word, the, the French words that it actually stands for, except that it means faith, the faithfully flat pre topology Thank you. I knew that uh, presentation fini was the end of it, but I can never remember the start. Uh, but this is FPF, FPPF. And similarly, uh, we can get the etal topology on affine schemes by instead insisting that morphism, instead of insisting that morphisms are flat and finitely presented, insisting that they're etal or finite etal, that gives you the finite etal topology. But there's so we can do lots of things with these pre-topologies. And for instance, if, you're, if you care about schemes, this gives you flat cohomology, which I think Delene used to prove the Vey conjectures. And we also get a tal cohomology if we work with the etal sites, and a finite etal cohomology, cohomology if we work with finite etal site, or pre-topology. But uh, while these are awesome, there is a slight problem with pre-topologies in that there's a, a natural imprecision. So to describe this imprecision, I'm going to show you what it means to be a sheaf on a pre-topology and show essentially that different pre-topologies can give rise to the same sheaves, which is sometimes frustrating because you can work with different pre-topologies, but have the same theory of sheaves. So, so if C is a category uh, with a pre-topology, so implicitly C has fiber products. Uh, if C is a cat with pre-topology, Tau, uh, a pre-sheaf P in the sheaf uh, pre-sheaf category is a tau sheaf if for all 
objects U in C and all covers in tau of U So implicitly, there's an I and I there. Uh, I'm just leaving it out for the sake of brevity. The diagram, where we start by looking at FU, we map into the product of I over all I and I of FUI. So this guy is the pairing map of all F of VIs, so I and I. And then we consider the maps P and Q down onto the doubly indexed product, I, J, and I, of F of UI fibered over U, UJ. So the above, the above diagram has to be an equalizer in order to do, for this to be a sheaf. So for this to be a sheaf, uh, P is induced by the first projection onto the pullback, and Q is induced by the second projection onto the pullback. So the, this definition of sheaf is very natural. It not only captures what's going on in topological spaces, but it also tells us that F is respecting the gluings, or F is respecting covers whenever covers are around. But as I alluded earlier, the problem with pre-topologies is I could give you different pre-topologies that give us the same sheaves. And that's a little bit frustrating. So uh, if I'm telling you that's a thing, I should probably show you how that's a thing. Uh, and first, I'll give you a very general phenomenon of when that happens. And then I'll actually give you a nice example, again, occurring in the category of schemes. So uh, if tau is a pre-topology on C, Define uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. P for pre and F for sheep. They're, they're definitely the same thing, right? <laughs> so uh, given a pre-topology on C, we're going to define a new pre-topology uh, by saying that it covers in the new pre-topology if there's a refinement in the original pre-topology. So uh, we say that a cover ui phi I, into u is in tau prime of u if and only if uh, there exists an index in a set J sub I uh, and a map uh, from an object VIJ into UI in C such that the set of covers from the VIJs into U is a tau cover of U. Then uh, tau and tau prime have the same sheaves.
because essentially you can always factorize things through one cover or one pre-topology or the other. And for a more explicit example of this in the same vein, uh, if C is the category of affine schemes, uh, yeah, I was using A scheme, uh, and we consider we take, say, tau as the FPPF pre-topology, then define a tau prime by saying a cover is a, by declaring a cover is a tau prime cover if and only if uh, the cover is an FPPF cover, so UI to you is a tau cover, and, e and each uh, map, say phi I here, is quasi finite. It then follows from corollary 17.16.2 of EGA4 that this gives the same sheaf or sheaves as the FPPF topology. <laughs> so the this topology tau prime and tau give the same sheaves, and it's kind of an example of the one above. Yeah. Yes? So what's this J and I? Where? So J and I? In the second line? Here? Yeah. Just some index set. Just any index set? Yeah. Okay. We could even take it to be singleton in order to capture that every tau cover is a tau prime cover. Okay. But it's saying we could also refine it. Yes, exactly. All possible refinements that we can get. And they give us the same sheaves. So in this way, growth into pre-topologies or pre-topologies are imprecise. And if you're interested in working with sheaves, so if you only want to work with the category of sheaves in order to capture the geometric nature of an object or of a way of looking at coverages on an object, we have to actually strengthen things a little bit. And to do that, we'll go through growth and deep topologies. So in order to do that, we have to work with sieves. And the cheeky definition for a sieve is a subfunctor of a representable functor. And uh, I think for today, all we'll have time to really do is go through the definition of sieve, uh, show that the weird, awkward set theoretic way of working with sieves is the same as subfunctor definition, and then define growth and deep topologies. So, a sieve S on an object. Uh, U of C is a subfunctor of the representable functor on U. So, in other words, when we talk about a sieve, we're saying that there are some morphisms that are small enough on that all map with codomain u that, uh, and a, sip, a map goes through the sieve if it's smaller or factors through one of the maps in, in the sieve. So uh, one way of working with sieves that 
people did classically is they said, take a map F in a sieve. So when we do that, we mean, so what we're going to do is perversely define S to be the union over all objects V in C. Say we're working over a small category if you're worried about foundations. Of S of V. It then follows that if F is any map in S for all maps G in the morphisms of C uh, with codomain equal to the domain of F, uh, F precomposed with G is also an S. Uh, I mean, the union is also a disjoint union. So. Uh, wait, but what, what is the definition there? So the definition is. That's a sub function. Sub function. And, and then these two as well, say with this S. Uh, here? Uh, S, is, S is being defined. Is I'm S perversely S defining. This is an alternative definition. Yes. That does work for recursion in some way. Yeah, and I'm actually going to show you how to go back and forth. And it actually comes from the inclusion natural transformation of S into this function here. So I'm going to start by just drawing the diagram. And by running around, we find that it works. So if we assume, say, that G is a map in C from, say, V into W, then what we want to look at first is uh, S of W with uh, S of G here into S of V. And downstairs, we have the inclusion natural transformation, S of W into U, and, or all W maps into U, and all V maps into U. And this guy's inclusion, where this is just C of G U. So, because this diagram commutes through the, this inclusion here, any map I pick here, I pre-compose with G, and then I embed here, it's also a map here. So these definitions end up being precisely the same. Uh, we'll focus, we'll use this definition a lot because it's convenient to work with a single covering arrow. But uh, when we get to actually defining sheaves, this gives a much nicer conceptual definition. So now, uh, I need one lemma. And depending on the time, we can either stop there or I can give the definition of a topology. So the lemma is if rho from v to u is any map uh, and s is a sieve on u, then the pullback sieve, rho, uh, rho upper star of s, which is defined to be all morphisms G in the category C such that rho precomposed with G is in the sieve S is a sieve on uh, V. And the proof is kind of just definitional, so we're going to omit it here.
And then uh, it's 12.52. Should I stop here or? Uh, we have to until 1. Until 1? Okay. So give the definition of a topology. Uh, so one other advantage of a growth unique topology that I haven't elucidated yet as opposed to a pre-topology is that a growth and deep topology can be defined on a category that doesn't have fiber products. Whereas pre-topologies are only definable on categories with fiber products. So topologies are more useful in that way. Uh, I mean, an alternative is to always just embed into the pre-sheaf topos and do things there. But uh, anyway. So for a growth and deep topology, instead of defining a collection of naive covers, we're actually going to define a collection of covering sieves for each object. So a growth and deep topology J on a cat C is for all objects U of C a collection of covering sieves uh, Collection of covering sieves J of U on U such that, well, and here we get our axioms. Our first axiom is that the sieve containing every map with codomain U had better be a covering sieve. So if we just throw everything that possibly exists at an object, that had better cover. So the sieve uh, I'm going to describe this sieve as codomain U, which is the set of all morphisms phi in C, such that the codomain of phi is U is a covering sieve. So once again, if we're being stupid about things, every morphism all glued together had better cover the object. Uh, What's the difference between this and the representable function? Uh, is, you mean a sieve? This particular. This is a representable function. So you can also write this as so the representable functor on U covers U. Uh, the second axiom is that once again covers need to play well with pullbacks. So if S is a covering sieve on U and rho is any morphism from D to U, then the pullback sieve uh, rho upper star of S has to cover V. So in the same way that uh, covers had to remain have to remain stable under pullback in the naive definition, they have to be remain stable under pullback with respect to pre-composition. And finally, the last axiom that gives a growth and deep topology is uh, if R is a sieve uh, on U. So here we're not assuming R covers. It's just something that is a sieve on you. And if 
Uh, S is some covering sieve on U. Then if uh, R covers S in the sense that if for all F in the sieve S, the pullback sieve of F with R is a covering sieve on the domain of F, then it had better be the case that R is actually a covering sieve as well. So if I give you just a sieve, some subfunctor, and if it turns out that for every morphism in some covering sieve, R covers every such map in the sense that this is a covering sieve, then R had better be a cover as well. This is the growth and deep topology version of the transitivity axiom that we saw for pre-topologies that says that you can compose functors or compose covers. Sorry, words are hard. And uh, we'll see later that these topologies give our precise with sieves. And next time, I want to show you how to create a topology out of a pre-topology. So pre-topology, the prefix pre on pre-topology actually means something. It's not just a nice accident of language that's formal but also how to go from a topology and create a pre-topology that generates that topology. So you can, if you have any set, of, if you have a set of covering sieves and your category has fiber products, you can recreate a set of covers in a nice sense. And in fact, it's maximal. What if it doesn't have a pullback sieve? Uh, then it doesn't have a pre-topology, just definition. And uh, after that, we'll get into the actual study of sheaves on our growth and deep topology. And next time, we'll finish by discussing the associated sheaf functor, which tells us that a category of sheaves with a growth and deep topology is a reflexive Cartesian closed subcategory of the pre sheaf category on C. And uh, I think that's it for today, so thanks for coming. Okay.